to talk about I'm here to talk about a uh, identification resource for mammal skulls that I created for my thesis project at the University of Kansas. Uh, it's called What's This Skull? Very aptly named. And I was inspired to create this identification resource because um, occasionally people find skulls outside. And when they do find those skulls, they often wonder, hmm, I wonder what animal this came from. And there aren't a lot of good resources for finding out that answer. Um, the options that are available to people are they can contact an expert like a natural history museum or a wildlife center and ask them uh, what the skull is, or they could uh, consult some identification resources. And the identification resources that exist for identifying skulls are often very technical and mostly aimed towards scientists rather than the everyday person. So I wanted to create an identification resource that could be understood by the everyday person, but is also detailed enough that if scientists wanted to use it, they could use it as well for various research projects like um, owl pellet surveys, uh, looking at the skulls that owls might be eating, or identifying skulls from owl pellets to find out what animals the owls might be eating and what animals like live in that area. So yeah, that's just um, the backstory of this project and now running into uh, the website itself. So it's online, anyone can access it. It's at um, this URL, which I'll post in the chat. Um, it is photo guided. So uh, there are photos for all of the skulls on my website and also for the um, identification section and the browse section, which I'll go over. And yeah, so the website I mostly aimed at people that are curious, people that find skulls that they, um, people that wanna identify skulls that they just find outside. Uh, also for educators, for people that wanna teach others how to identify skulls, uh, this is would be really useful for mammalogy courses, for example, or maybe just uh, classroom activities where you want to teach uh, students about adaptations. The skulls reflect a lot of adaptations for various diets and lifestyles, or maybe just um, different types of animals, things along those lines. And then for researchers, like I mentioned with the owl pellet example, and then how to use this website. So um, there's the keys section, which actually guides people through identification. And then there's the browse section if you just wanna look at all the different pictures of skulls that are available in your area. And I want to make this website for um, the entire United States, but right now only Kansas is represented because there's about 500 species in the United States and it would be a lot to tackle all at once. So I just started with one state to uh, make it easier to get up and running. So I'll go over the browse section first since that's a little bit simpler. So here, um, since I only have Kansas, uh, this is just all the mammals from Kansas, but it shows all of the mammals um, that can be found. So we have the opossum, armadillo, all the different rabbit species. And it also includes introduced species, which are marked with the asterisks. Um, I wanted to include introduced species because uh, just as like you can find a deer skull outside, you can just as easily find a cow skull. So I wanted to make sure that introduced species were covered so that if someone found any skull outside, they would be able to identify it. Uh, and then we have the rodents, which go on for a very long time, a lot of rodents. The shrews and the moles, the bats, the carnivores, even-toed hoofed mammals, and the odd-toed hoofed mammals. So if you click on any one of these, so let's click on this one, for example, it'll show you more aspects of the skull, not just the side view, it'll show the top and the bottom view. Uh, it'll tell you how long the skull is in case you want to compare it to a skull that you found. And it also provides some more information about the species um, from good sources in case you want to read up more. So uh, I have the Kansas Mammal Atlas represented here. I have Wikipedia, just in case. Uh, Animal Diversity Web, uh, which is something run by the University of Michigan and has very good articles about various uh, animal species. 
Encyclopedia Britannica, which is online encyclopedia, and Mammalian Species, which is a journal uh, run by the uh, American Society of Mammalogists. So it's a bit more technical, but in case someone wants that level of detail, they could follow this link and get it there. Uh, I say who the photos are by, what the copyright is. So I've specifically made it Creative Commons so that people can freely use these images how they see fit for educational and research purposes. And then I say uh, where I got this specimen from, so University of Kansas and the identifier for that specimen if someone wanted to look it up in the University of Kansas database. So that is the browse section. Next up is the keys. So the identification portion of my website is um, basically a pictured dichotomous key. And if you never heard of dichotomous keys before, uh, just to break it down, uh, die meaning to, cotomous meaning to cut. Um, the way that dichotomous keys work is that it asks you um, a series of questions based off of alternative characters. It's like um, in this example image, it says last tooth triangular or last tooth not triangular. So it'll just ask you um, questions like that where it's either one or the other. And then you keep click, uh, you keep picking whichever question most, most closely matches whatever skull you're trying to identify. And eventually it will bring you to the correct identification. Uh, it's just narrowing down the possibilities based off of the characters of your skull until you finally reach an identification. Uh, so I will show how that works. This is the start of the key. Uh, there is a back button in, in case you need to go back, uh, like if you found that you've made a mistake, like if the characters aren't matching up with your skull and like, oh, I made a mistake somewhere, you can go back to the previous step and, tr or and try again. You can uh, restart all the way from the beginning of the key if you think you've made a major error. It shows you the number of possibilities remaining. So you have some sort of idea of how much longer it's going to take. And then these are the two options. So uh, there's a written description of the option. There's also a picture accompanying it. So for example, this one is toothless gap between front of mouth and cheek teeth. And um, I wanted to make this as non-technical as possible. So while toothless, toothless gap between front of mouth and cheek teeth, it, it, that is a diastema, but uh, the, the average person isn't going to know what diastema means. So I describe what it is and then I include it in parentheses in case someone wants to know what the technical term for this character that I'm talking about is. And then I have um, arrows and lines pointing to the characters. So you can see that exactly what I'm talking about when I mean a toothless gap. And then the other side is just no toothless gap. So it's either one or the other, there's no in between. And I actually have a skull with me today that we can try running through the key to show off how it works. So, the skull does not appear to have a toothless gap. It seems to have teeth all along the mouth. So I'm gonna go with this option. And then for here, for this step, um, there's actually multiple uh, parts to each side. So um, any one of these can be true in order to go with this option. Uh, it just, it gives you multiple options in case maybe your skull might be missing one of these characters, like if it's broken, or if you just wanna check both of them to make absolutely sure that you're going with the right option. So hole in palette or no hole in palette. Um, if you can see this correctly, it looks very solid. It doesn't look like the picture on the left. So there's no hole. And then also three or, or five incisors on each side or three or less incisors on each side. Um, not sure how well this is coming through, but it looks like there are three on each side. So we'll go with this option. And then it's talking about if the skull is small, uh, less than two inches, or uh, if the skull is large, greater than one and a half inch. So these size ranges do overlap, which is why I've marked it with the asterisk, explains that at the bottom. So you can go with the second option as well if you find a skull that is within this overlapping range. But this is pretty clearly greater than two inches. So I'll go with this option. Now, brain case higher than eye sockets or brain case about level with eye sockets. 
and uh, long processes extending back down off the back of skull. Uh, it's called a paraocipital process. And I hear I've highlighted them blue so people can identify what I'm talking about or no long processes. And it does not look like there are any long processes. And it looks like the eye socket is about level with the brain case. It doesn't look as offset as the picture on the left. So I'll go with the right. Ah, and now I have reached the carnivores. So it will let you know when you reach certain points in the key, just in case you can't continue because um, maybe your, your skull is missing all of the teeth and here it's talking about teeth. So you just can't continue. At least you know that it's a carnivore. And also uh, notice that the possibilities remaining has been going down with each step. So now we're talking about the teeth. And my last tooth is not small and peg-like. So I'll go with the picture on the right. Now it wants me to count. There's one tooth missing on one side, but one side has all of them. So after the canine, there's one, two, three, four. So I'll go with this one. And it is not five, it is four, let's get this one. And then the shape of the last tooth, is it triangular or not triangular? Looks pretty triangular to me, this one. And boom, we have reached the identification and that is the correct identification for this skull. It is American Badger. And then you can see all sorts of information about it. So you can make sure that the pictures actually line up with what you're trying to identify. Uh, you can make sure that the size is correct. And if it does seem like you've made a mistake, you can just press the back arrow on the browser and it will bring you back into the key where you were. Or um, like I mentioned, you can click once you're back in the key, you can click the back a step, or you can click restart to go all the way to the beginning. All right, that's about it for my presentation. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to gather people's thoughts. Um, if they had any suggestions for improvements or ways I, I can expand on this. Um, I already have quite a long list of ideas. Like I wanna make a printable version of the key. I wanna make an offline version so you don't have to have an internet connection. Um, I am interested in creating lesson plans and maybe uh, key like keys that are specific for lesson plans. So rather than including all of the mammals of Kansas, maybe just include a small subset of very common mammals so it's not as long. Um, there, I want to include, of course, more mammals, eventually cover the entire United States rather than just Kansas. Um, now I can include more educational sections as well, like maybe a section on how to know the school. So helping to orient people, like where are the eyes, where are the brain case, where's the nose, uh, what, are the, what are the different types of teeth that mammals can have and why do they have these different types of teeth? Um, what are the different bones of the skull? What are the different holes? What are they used for? Um, yeah, there is a lot of opportunities for expansion and I am open to ideas. So far you're getting a lot of praise saying this is an amazing <laughs> resource in the chat. I did yeah. see, uh, Megan says she might've missed it, but where are the skull photos? from and how are they taken? They're great. Ah, uh, yeah. So I picked specimens from the University of Kansas collection. So that's where all of the skulls are from. And then I had a photography set up. Um, I had a DSLR camera on a copy stand. So it was a like a top-down view. And then I just positioned the skull underneath the camera, made sure the lighting was good and all of the settings for the camera. We're, we're good. And sometimes I had to do focus stacking where I had to take multiple images at different focus levels and then combine them to create an all in focus image. Um, that's what you need to do for very, very small skulls because it's difficult to, the way that the camera settings work, it's just very difficult to get the entire skull in focus while achieving enough light. Okay. Uh, more suggestions. Yeah, 3D printing is a good idea. There, 
Um, I also had ideas to include links to 3D models. So there's not going to be 3D models for every single school, but there are some publicly available. Um, let's see. Oops, I was muted. Adenia, you have a question or uh, idea? Yeah, I suppose a question and a, and a comment. Just wanted to see great job, um, really good work. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing it and doing it. And my question, and hopefully it makes sense in context, but I, I, you mentioned it in the beginning. You said, I think you did this as a part of your dissertation work. And so I wanted to know more about that because I hear it. This sounds really, it seems phenomenal. And that's definitely a big undertaking, both in terms of the work and the ideas and all the things you're planning forward. So I feel, I know maybe as a PhD candidate myself, I'm like so interested in how did you do this as part of your work? Because it might help other people what are their students or half students thinking about this kind of stuff? It kind of came up in the spinach conference in terms of different types of chapters. And then secondly, where are you at in terms of your academic trajectory? Because I hear you're going to do a lot. So I'm like, well, how is this supported? <laughs> where are you going? And so it's sort of, it's sort of personal-ish, but I think it could have application in terms of people who work in collections, people who might be able to support you, help you, collaborate with you, um, and hopefully it all makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So the personal side, um, I've always been interested in skulls ever since I found a dead raccoon outside. And I was like, oh, if I just leave this to decompose, eventually I'll have the bones and those might be pretty cool to keep. And I was interested in biology. So yeah, I just went ahead to try that, cleaned up the skull. And I just found the skull fascinating, especially since I was taking human anatomy at the time. And I was like comparing the, the raccoon skull to the human skull to try and study for the, the bone exam. Uh, so I got interested in skulls that way. And then um, I found various online communities around bone collecting. And uh, sometimes they would ask for skull identification requests or like they would, someone would post a picture of a skull and they would be like, hey, what animal is this from? And sometimes uh, other people would respond with correct identifications and sometimes they wouldn't. So I was like, oh, if only there was a easily accessible learning resource for people to identify schools and learn how to identify schools, then that would really help solve this issue. So that's how I got the inspiration for this. Uh, and yeah, it was, I created this as part of my master's thesis and it was just a project-based thesis. So, um, the this entire website was my thesis. I also did a bit of a literature review, like finding out exactly what mammals are in Kansas, because it's a bit more complicated than you would think. Um, like some of the shrew species or some of the rodent species are a bit contested on the number or which exact species they are. Uh, then I did also a literature review on how to construct dichotomous keys, how to do it most effectively, um, and then, yeah, the rest of the website or the rest of my thesis was just creating the website and taking the pictures and creating the writing the key. Um, and as far as future advancements for the website, it's mostly a personal endeavor. So it's something that I definitely want to expand on because I, I feel like that there's a need for this type of resource. Yeah, it's not necessarily supported, but I am more than happy to keep working on it. Like I've already been taking pictures of more skulls to add to the website at some point in the future. So yeah, and I think there were more questions in the chat. Uh, plans on Are, making this. Yeah, I can read them to you if that helps. Okay. Um, sure. Let's see. Do, do, do. Um, I did see that there was a question about making it into an app. Yes, so there's several <laughs> questions on making it into an app. <laughs> yeah, that's something I've definitely considered. I've never made an app before, but I think it would translate well because it's mostly just displaying text and images and clicking on images to bring you to a different part. Um, something definitely to look into. Uh, there was a question about skull anatomy. Does it differ much between male and female? Yes, it can. There can be sexual dimorphism in skulls. Um, for example, there's a feature called the sagittal crest, which run, runs along the back of the skull, and it's where jaw muscles attach to, uh, and it tends to be much stronger in males. Um, 
Do I have any with a strong sagittal crest here? I don't think so, but yes, there can be differences. And that's something that I've considered. Like maybe I want to show more than just one individual. This, uh, this badger kind of shows a sagittal crest, this line running, running along the, the back of the brain case. So it might be a lot smoother or not as pronounced in, in females. Um, yeah, I would have to figure out how to incorporate more individuals into um, the, the species page. And of yeah, course there's like- I like that you have all those links. You can always then add more hyperlinks to like, here's a female or a male. Yeah. And then um, there's also with the um, the ungulates, you know, oh, right. deer can have antlers, but here I haven't shown one with antlers because it was actually, it would have been much harder to take a picture of a skull with antlers because it would be so much bigger. That's why I picked one without antlers. But that, yeah, that's another way that the differences can manifest. Suggestion, uh, uh, final step of identification, including an animal picture. That was, that's a um, some feedback I've gotten before. Uh, it's, the main problem with that is I would just have to work around copyright issues because I took all of these skull pictures myself, so I don't have to worry about copyright. But if I want to include pictures of live animals, I don't have any of those, so I would just have to work out being able to use those images on my website. But that is something that people have suggested many times before. Yeah, it looks like Christy replied to that, and she says that I have photos of the animal that children can match up with the skulls in our workshop, so that could also be cool. Like, as you said, you were thinking about doing lesson plans. That could be one of mm -hmm. something that you could do. And maybe I'm sure there's plenty of folks here that can point you to, um, you know, open licensed images. Expansion to include all Virginia species. I'm actually from Virginia, so Virginia is high on my list of states to do next. Wikimedia, yeah, um, there are a lot of images of mammals on uh, Wikimedia. There, there might not be specific rodent species. Like I, I would have to check, but I'm not sure if there's like a Paragnathus flavescens picture, but there might be. Pictures of damaged skulls. Yeah, so damaged skulls are a bit tricky because they might not have the features that are in my the, the key portion of my website. And I did try to write the key to where um, I didn't use characters that are commonly lost. But like, for example, the teeth, the teeth are the most important character for identifying mammal skulls, but oftentimes skulls lose their teeth. So I, it was just something that I had to use, even though they are commonly lost. Um, some One way that I could get around broken skulls is I can use a different type of key called a multi-axis key rather than a dichotomous key. And the way that multi-axis keys work is it just gives you a list of characters and you just click on the characters that match your skull. Um, and it will narrow down the possibilities based off of the characters you've selected. So you don't have to select all of the characters, um, like if you have a damaged skull. Uh, so that's one way I could work damaged skulls into my key. Uh, yeah, the American Society of Mammalogists has pictures. That's another avenue I could go if I wanted live pictures. Uh, schools, students bring a teacher or school. And uh, someone else pointed you to a Sketchfab library that has some of the 3D models. Mm -hmm. I think just sharing for awareness. And then um, Verity has brought up that um, ASM, the American Society of Mammalogists, um, has a mammal image library. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's a link there. And then Anjali has what sounds like a really fun activity where, once again, as you're saying, you're like thinking about building lesson plans. One that she thought of would be like if students find a skull or, you know, you would have maybe a set of skulls have the students draw artistically what they think the animal would look like. Um, and then of course, you know, show them and then they can like use your Thomas key. I really love that, especially because that not only brings in art, but it also brings in a lot of what we do um, with extinct 
where we're only looking at fossils, as I'm not a paleontologist, Jennifer, Jen can jump in, but I just feel like that really connects to a lot of what we're trying to do, um, reconstructing um, extinct animals and what they might have looked like and done. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is also a really good idea for a possible lesson plan. A lot of times when you look at skulls, you would imagine that they they don't exactly match up with what the living animal looks like. If like if you look at an opossum, you see these giant canines, you might think it's a fierce predator, but then you look at an opossum in life and you know, they're just they're just opossums. They're not super fierce. Yeah, I can imagine you getting some really interesting creative things, especially with some of the, you know, like the armadillo skull or mm -hmm. I feel like students might come up with some really fantastical looking animals, which would also be fun. Yeah, if you've ever seen a manatee skull, it is kind of hard to wrap your head around. <laughs> so I would like to see a kid try to interpret a manatee skull. Yeah, are there any other suggestions or comments? Our latest one is from Adrienne, who says that I think it's really useful that you include non-native introduced species that are present. Yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely don't want someone to be confused uh, trying to run a cow skull through my key and ending up with like a bison or something. Anybody else have any final comments? Um, ooh, okay, we have Miranda says, I wonder if there's a way to let people submit real world examples that they have ID'd using this guide, which perhaps you could post or include somewhere. I think that's a really interesting thought. And I was also thinking about how, yeah, how to connect it with iNaturalist. I'm pretty sure you can mm. submit um, like skulls as, as um, so like evidence for a naturalist that's right if anybody knows. yeah you can yeah um yeah i could encourage people to post their findings on iNaturalist. um as for real world examples like maybe like a showcase of skulls that people have id using the guide might be best to put like maybe a Twitter feed on the website and then have people use a hashtag for skulls that they identify and then it would just like automatically update the Twitter feed on the website. Ooh, I like that, could that. Be, that could be a way to do it. Yeah. And you can also make an iNaturalist project that's just like ever expand, you know, like one that, I don't know if you've ever done that before, where you just name it, like, yeah, what is this skull? And then people can join it and put skulls in from anywhere. Mm -hmm. Or just Kansas. You could set it just to being Kansas. So that'd be another way. Yeah. I have seen iNaturalist projects for skulls and bones but there could be one specifically for using this website. Oh yeah, a uh, ID day, that would be really cool. I, I did something a little similar. Uh, I did like a bone collecting workshop uh, once and then I had people bring in skulls that they wanted to identify and that they could try it out using my website. This was during the testing phase um, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> People would just show me like a little scrap of the skull and be like, what is this? And I'll be like, oh, it's a groundhog. And they'd be like, what? How do you know that? <laughs> great way to exercise my, my puzzle skills. Absolutely. And that's a great outreach activity mm -hmm. for sure. Because it's bringing in like why we have museums. One of the museums is the experts that are housed um, right. and the the reference collections to be able to compare. I did I did that very very recently to Verity Mathis, the collection manager at the Florida Museum. <laughs> she brought her a very strange piece of something. Yeah. And um, I have tried using this with kids before. Um, it was only one event though. We we grouped the kids into like groups of five or six. Um, these were about fourth to sixth grade kids, and I gave them a mystery skull, and they were able to work through the key to get the correct identification um, with help of an adult. So there's definitely potential for it to be used with younger younger students. 
Absolutely. Um, Marshall just suggested that if you do make, you know, in the future, if you do make the photo submission fully public, having some kind of level of verification. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Approval. Usually that's not much of a worry if people, if it's not a very well-known hashtag, for example, then it's not likely that you're going to get trolls, but it is something to consider. Absolutely. Does anybody else have any any more comments for Rebecca and questions, etc.? This was such a really fantastic resource. Thank you so much for coming to show it with us. And this is so cool that this was part of your graduate studies. And this is what, obviously this is something that you can grow and continue to use wherever you're headed next. So this is super neat. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to expanding on it. And Verity says uh, to get in touch because she would love to see how the um, ASM, the Mammalogy Public Education Committee could help growing this up. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, she says she'll email, but if anything happens, I have both of your emails. So <laughs> I can always connect if that needs to happen. Yeah, uh, one thing to note is that my KU email is going to deactivate in a few months. So maybe okay. I can give you a more permanent email in case. Yeah, reach yeah, out. please do. And I would just definitely put a pitch for joining the education committee and, uh, you know, uh, for ASM. It's a really nice committee. Yeah, a lot of good folks doing a lot of really fun stuff, and they would love love all the things that you're doing right now. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. All right. I'm going to stop recording.